Hi, everybody. Today's discussion is going to be about FDA guidance and the new ones that are coming out. Um, I'm actually in a really good mood today. It's another casual Friday at Medical Device Academy. And uh, thanks to Lindsay Walker, our director of sales, I have this very cool drink. Free promo, Lindsay. This, this stuff is definitely witchcraft. It, it says it only has two carbs, two net carbs, and it's gluten-free, it's dairy-free, it's keto, and it has caffeine, and it tastes good. I don't know what they do. But <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. Now back to the really exciting stuff, not. Um, we're going to talk about FDA guidance documents that are brand new, um, that are coming out, and the ones that just came out. So the FDA dropped in the first month of the new fiscal year, October, a ton of guidance documents. And they publish their list like they do every year in the new fiscal year in October. About mid-October, they say, these are our priorities for new guidance documents in the next fiscal year. And they say, here's our A list for final, our A list for drafts, our B list for final, and our B list for draft. And then a few years ago, they added to that here are the documents that are more than 10 years old that we're going to review. And they do retrospective reviews and they do it for 10 years old, 20 years old, and 30 years old. So over the course of 10 years, they should get all of their guidance documents updated to be current, at least within the last 10 years. So this year, they're looking at 2013, 2023, 1993, and 1983. There are no 1983 guidance documents out there, so that list is zero, but there are a ton of 510K guidance documents in there that they're planning on reviewing, and I'll get to those. But what is uh, what has already dropped is a new updated guidance document on breakthrough device designation, and they've got another one coming. I'm, I'm, uh, the draft already dropped, and I think the, the final version is going to be dropping uh, I think that's the sequence, but we're seeing a lot of changes and improvements in the Breakthrough Device Designation Program. I posted a blog recently on the Breakthrough Device Designation, so if you're interested in that, check out our blogs uh, on our Medical Device Academy uh, blog page. The brand new FDA A-list final versions that are coming out that you need to actually pay attention to because it's going to have a major impact on your company, is the brand new software requirements one and the brand new cybersecurity requirements. Neither one has been released yet, but we've been anticipating this for years. We've seen drafts, and this is on their A-list as a final document now. So I'm surprised it hasn't already been released with all the other ones that came out in October. So uh, it might be a Christmas present. It might be uh, Thanksgiving for everybody. But we're, we should expect it very soon, a brand new software requirements document listing what needs to be in a 510k submission for software validation. And I'm sure they will make changes and a brand new cybersecurity document. And what we're expecting is the section of your submission that is just software right now is going to be software plus cybersecurity. So it's twice as much content now. And it's because not only do you need a cybersecurity plan, but you also need testing reports that you actually have to do some cybersecurity testing. On the on the uh, B list, I'm sorry, on the A list, but for drafts, they also have a de novo uh, electronic submission template guidance that's going to be coming out. So they already have one that's come out that's final for. Um, the 510Ks, but they're going to have a de novo one as well. We're using the brand new eStar templates already. We're already doing a bunch of uh, 510K course webinars about it, if you're interested in that. And we've also included them for de novo. So we're, we're showing the nuances between the two different types of submissions. But the FDA is going to come out with their own de novo guidance on that as well. And there are some significant differences, such as the risk table that they asked for. That doesn't show up in a uh, 510K guidance. Another item is the benefit risk analysis. So both of those elements, I would expect some specific guidance. They also don't have the substantial equivalent section. So they're going to be probably providing some guidance about how to document properly the sections on um, 
what other devices provide alternative treatment and whether how you demonstrate your device has a significant benefit versus the risks associated with your device. So that should be in that new uh, de novo uh, draft guidance that is on the A list. You wouldn't think the B list stuff would be very high priority, but there is something in there that I'm, I'm fairly confident they're going to release. It probably won't be in this year. It will probably be in the next calendar year, which is still part of fiscal year 2023, uh, probably in first quarter um, or beginning of second quarter next year, like April timeframe, just like they did a couple of years ago, the ASCA pilot. So ASCA pilot. ASCA stands for Accreditation Scheme for Conformity Assessment. So if you have no idea what ASCA means or what it's about, the ASCA pilot is um, they're trying to make sure the testing labs that, do, that are doing your testing for your pre-market submissions are accredited for the standard they're doing to the testing for, and they know what the differences are between the standard and what the FDA wants. I'll give you an example. Um, if you are doing cytotoxicity testing, it's not just enough to do cytotoxicity testing. You have about five different methods you could choose. There are specific methods the FDA would prefer that you use. They have specific guidance on the ratio of um, solvent for the extraction to the surface area of the device. They prefer you to do surface area instead of mass of the device. And they also have additional requirements if you have a device that's going to be in contact for a long-term period of time, so more than 30 days, then they have different extraction conditions they want you to use as worst case scenario. All the, that's just one example of the kind of thing that they want a, a biocompatibility testing lab to know and put that detail in the report um, so they, they have all their questions answered. Now, right now, we have to type into the ESTAR details about the testing report. But if it was an ASCA test report, we would have a supplemental piece that was already provided by the testing lab. We could attach that along with the testing report and the FDA could do a streamlined review. That's the idea behind it. So it streamlines the review process and spend it's less time, hopefully for me, but I don't, I'm not going to count on it, but definitely less time for the reviewer because they know it's an ASCA um, certified lab. Another thing that we stumbled across, in, and I discussed this yesterday in our video training on the, the um, voluntary standards, this new ASCA pilot program, we have a web page for the ASCA program pilot. They have a web page for manufacturers on how to use it. And then they have a page that gives you a list of testing labs that are participating. And I wasn't sure about the, there's two search bars. The first search bar, was very clear, but the second search bar, I wasn't sure if you could type in the number. So after the session, I went back and I typed in 10993. And sure enough, you can sort the list and find which companies have, the, which testing labs are certified for that particular standard. So the only one that is for 10993 right now is NAMSA, but hopefully the some of the other labs will join the uh, pilot soon and we'll be able to get those ASCA uh, supplement uh, documentation for the test reports when we submit to the FDA as well. Uh, there are lots of electrical safety and EMC testing labs. So any of those tests you're looking for, you shouldn't have any trouble finding a lab that's on that ASCA list. But for biocompatibility right now, we have one. So we need a few more players to get involved in that. If you are one of those labs, maybe you're watching my video and you will do that soon. Now, if, if you're interested in going in, in um, Finding out more about that, there is a link down below in this video description. It's for our 510K course. It's one of the videos. I will, in the future, um, make that available for purchase by itself because I know it's going to be a popular one. But for right now, the only way you can get it is you got to buy our 510K course. So if you were on the fence, maybe that pushes you over the fence to get our, our uh, video on how to use the voluntary standards and create a declaration of conformity. And there's no more use of 3514. There's no more use of 3654. If you've been doing them for that long, you just use the E-Star template instead. And it creates a declaration conformity automatically for you and lets you do electronic signatures. So very nice tool in the E-Star um, template. 
Now we get to the next section. Now we're going to talk about the new, not the new guidances, because those were the new guidances. Now we're going to talk about old guidances that they're doing this retrospective review on. So number one, 2013, the guidance documents that are coming out that are relevant to our 510K clients, the RF wireless guidance. So we use that a lot. Almost all your electronic devices out there now have wireless functionality. Well, there's an RF wireless guidance document that was released in 2013. That's going to be 10 years old now. So after 10 years, you can imagine wireless technology has moved a little bit. They're going to have new and different requirements in that guidance document for RF wireless documentation in your submissions. So that we can expect to be updated sometime at the end. They're going to review it in 2013. So I don't know if we'll get a draft or we'll just get a new update at the end of the year. But sometime in 2023, we expect that. Also, there's IDE. IDE stands for Investigational Device Exemption and EFS, Early Feasibility Study. This is for companies that are required to have clinical data to demonstrate the claims or, or performance of their device. We're seeing more and more devices are requiring clinical data. All the, all the de novo devices, for the most part, require the clinical data. And if it's a significant risk device, then you have to do an IDE, which means getting permission from the FDA to do your study uh, before you can get the IRB to approve it or in parallel with that. And then in addition to that, there's early feasibility studies, and this would be up to 10 patients for your first in human studies. So we're actually working with a couple of clients with those types of studies right now, and this guidance document is going to be updated. So that's one of the ones that are going to be reviewing. There's also a 510K guidance for SpO2, so pulse oximeters. For two, uh, 2003, we have two more guidance documents that I thought would be of interest. One's for chemical indicators, if you're doing a 510K on a chemical indicator. Uh, this would be similar to biological indicators, but it's a chemical indicator to see that it's changed um, after you sterilized. And then there's a frequently asked questions document on reprocessing. There's a lot more interest in reprocessing medical devices that are single use to lower our healthcare costs. And so the FDA will be reviewing that frequently asked questions document. And, and I can expect some significant guidance uh, document changes because the FDA prioritizes these re reprocessors for inspections within, um, within six months of their initial 510K clearance. And those companies, um, when, you, when you submit that 510K, for the reprocessors, those devices are, are considered fairly high risk by the FDA because they're reprocessing a device and there could be some damage to the device and they sometimes make modifications. Um, so they, they need to make sure that those are done according to whatever you've validated and within the scope of your 510K. And you have to have a new 510K for those reprocessors. Um, and that's 20 years old. So I'm sure there's some changes they want to implement since 20 years ago. Um, the third one we're looking at 30 years ago, 1993. There is a ton of 510K guidance documents for 1993. Uh, if you think about the timing, um, the, the QSR was implemented in 1996, but they were, they were really starting to ramp up the 510K guidance documents. So the very oldest 510K guidance documents are from this time period. So you're looking at sharps containers, washer disinfectors, gowns and drapes. That should be a big change because we have all kinds of things that have come out of COVID because the, they looked at the stockpile and saw all the gowns and drapes weren't, weren't usable anymore that had been stockpiled. And all the hospitals saw variable quality from their supply chain coming in. So we can expect that to be updated. Syringes and needles. There were tons of changes that were made um, in the last decade to the standards, but those guidance documents are from 1993, 30 years old. So they predate any of the standards. So we can expect those to change. Uh, clinical thermometers, that one's going to change with all the, the digital uh, devices that companies have come out with for measuring your the temperature of your face using thermographic systems. We can expect that to be updated. Sterilizers, there's been all kinds of new interest in sterilizers that don't use ethylene oxide. We can expect that to be updated. Uh, urinal stents, that's going to be updated. So that's a very old product, but 
the, all kinds of scent technology has changed over the years, over the last 30 years. Now with uh, CAD CAM uh, cutting of stents in, in different types of materials that are now available with nitinol. And then last but not least, we had biopsy devices. There have been all kinds of changes in biopsy and doing all kinds of tests for oncology, uh, taking smaller samples and taking them less invasively. So we can expect that to change. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine. Uh, guidance documents in 2023, I mean, sorry, 1993, that I was listing off um, that are going to be reviewed during the fiscal year 2023. So a ton of changes that you can expect to those guidance documents. Uh, plus, don't forget the A-list final guidance documents for software, um, what documentation is required for your software development, and what documentation and testing reports are required for cybersecurity those are being up updated. I don't know whether it's going to be a Thanksgiving present or it's going to be a Christmas present, but it, you're going to be lucky you're going to get this. And um, that'll be a whole lot more paperwork, twice as much, uh, expected in your uh, e-star submissions. And don't forget, we've got links before below in the description for the A-list, B-list, and the retrospective reviews for fiscal year 2023. That will be in the link down below, and then we have another link for the 510K course um, if you're interested in that um, webinar about uh, voluntary standards and how to reference them in your eStar templates. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a fantastic Friday, and uh, thank you, Lindsay. Have a great day. Bye-bye.